Our next guest uh, agrees that the wiretapping made this pretty close to an open and shut case for the prosecution. Joining us right now is former federal prosecutor himself, Doug Burns. For more than two decades, he has prosecuted and defended SEC cases. Doug, good to have you back with Matt Thank and myself. You. It was. I mean, you listen to those wiretaps and you say, that's it. I mean, he's yeah. a guilty man. You know what it was? It was complexity versus simplicity. In other words, the defense tried to make it very, very complicated. The stuff was already public. I didn't act on it. There was no causation. But at the end of the day, it's so funny because those three quotes were the ones that I was saying all along. They shook on it. It's a done deal. I mean, to jurors off the street. And the legal test, by the way, you talk about simplicity. Right. Is that information available to the average investor? And the answer is no, it's not. Okay? And it's like betting on horse racing when you know the outcome. And the fact is, the jury uh, did, un you know, the unpleasant duty, by the way. It's not fun and games and laughing and smiling. They stood in judgment of another human being and convicted him of serious crimes. But they did what they had to do. Doug, you know, so far, yeah. you know, we, we've heard this described as the crime of the century, probably a little yeah. bit too much considering Bernard Madoff, uh, right. but also the big story outside of the markets. Probably it's a little yeah. more important than what's going on in the daily trade. Put it into context for us. I mean, well, Ivan Bolsky, yeah. Michael Milken, Raj Raj Retnam. Well, uh, first of all, I mean, and you guys might find this interesting, you know, the world of criminal law goes well beyond financial crime. So you talk really? about, you talk about <laughs> organized crime. No, joking aside, international drug dealing, terrorism, murder. I mean, as a federal prosecutor myself, I was involved in those areas. In the world of financial crime, this was a big case no doubt about it, 60-some million dollars. But you know what it is, Matt, really? It's, it's a deterrence case. They want to send a message to Wall Street that, A, we're coming after this more aggressively, and then, B, you better be careful because we may be listening to your conversations. That's a good point. And I think about the role of hedge funds or potential role of hedge funds in all of this. Um, obviously, it was a hedge fund. But, I mean, what's the next big target? Do they go after even more hedge funds in this? Uh, well, it's interesting, uh, Carol. They have this expert network case that I know you guys mm -hmm. are familiar with, and that's a company that put people on the inside of tech companies in touch with people at, you know, trading entities and ostensibly passing inside information. So I think the government's going to march forward. There's another trial, by the way, right now getting underway, something three or four floors above, you know, where the Roger Ottenham case was in the same building in the Southern District. So I think, I mean, this was a big win for the government. And at the end of the day, they were right. They said in the summation, the most powerful evidence you're going to hear is the defendant's own words, you know, and, and, and is wiretaps. If they did not have that wiretaps, right. it would have been a much, much more difficult Very case. Very good question, of course. Um, normally, uh, insider trading is done on a circumstantial timeline. I call Matt at 10.14 and then at 10.15 he trades. So we say, oh, Doug must have told Matt something illegal. But it's not for sure. It's not necessarily beyond a reasonable doubt. So when you actually hear the conversations, um, this case was well defended, by the way. I mean, they started implying that this material was already in the financial media and was already public. And if you subtract the wiretaps, back to your original question, have been a much closer case, in my opinion. What about, you know, sentence, you look at sentencing yeah. and we have heard that they decide based on how much, you know, he exactly. profited exactly. from this. The guy's a self-made billionaire. Are the prosecutors going to try and make the point that this $60 million, $68 million is only a small portion of what we don't know he really yeah, got I'm, from I'm insider trading? I'm glad you asked that because... You know, you have a difference between guilt and innocence and then sentencing factors and potential mitigation. You may have heard me and other experts saying that at one point in the trial they were saying he had lost something like $60 million having received the insider information. The government quickly countered by saying, doesn't matter, it's the same crime. They're right. Still but for purposes of the sentencing, tallying up the wins and losses, it could be relevant and may mitigate the sentence, possibly. Doug, Doug just quickly, does sure. you have a strong case in an appeal, do you think? Well, the appeal, you know, in many cases you say, well, there's really not a heck of a lot. But they do have this issue. Uh, they had what's called a Franks hearing about the viability of the wiretaps, and that's the issue on appeal. So we'll find out. Doug Burns, thank you as always. We My appreciate pleasure. it. Pleasure, Doug.